All right. So uh, welcome. And uh, so this is going to be pretty free form here. Um, I already was talking to Brian about how what a fool I am for ever trying to do live coding again because I've gotten burned so many times. But since this is like uh, informal, hopefully I won't mess up too badly. Plus, I also have the answer um, on a different tab of my browser. So if I if I have to copy and paste, the one thing is <clears throat> that when I originally did this, it took me like four hours to work the script out. So um, because I, you know, I'm still kind of learning. So if we can actually get this to work in an hour um, or 50 minutes, it'll be pretty amazing. Uh, part of it was I wasn't, sh I had been asked to work on this by somebody else and I wasn't sure sort of what strategy to take. So, but now it's more clear to me like what needs to happen. So um, I wanted to start by talking about the data set itself. So this is like a real data set um, it's a huge study, big longitudinal study that went on for, for um, what, 14 years. And um, there are a large number of participants. So one of the problems is this data set is so big that um, it, when you load two of the files, it takes up quite a bit of your computer's memory. And then on top of that, if you looked at the PDF that actually explains what all the fields are, for the first data file, it's 1,500 pages long. And the second one is 500 pages long. So I had both of those PDFs and both of the data sets open. And my computer was just like the fan came on and, was, and everything was going really slowly. And I realized like I was really kind of pushing my computer to the limit, trying to work with all these big files at one time. So one of the first things that we're going to do is to use some of the subsetting commands that we learn to just get the parts of the data set out that we're interested in. And then we'll go ahead and save those in another file and basically close, uh, uh, delete the, uh, or, or close out the, um, the large data sets so that that'll free up more memory on our computer. The other thing <clears throat> is that um, I'm not really into, I'm not a social sciences person, so I'm not really sure what the conventions are, but it certainly looks like on these types of surveys, um, it's very standard to code everything with numbers. And so that's great because um, if you have like a coding key that tells you how you did the coding, then it's very straightforward and there's no question about what things mean. But in our, so, so for example, there's a lot of different um, codes for missing data. In fact, there's various types of missing data, like the person didn't want to answer the question or the person didn't know how to answer the question and so on. And whereas in R, there's actually a special, that uh, um, special NA symbol that you use, which is a flag to R that the, these are missing data that should not be used in calculations. So part of the thing that we need to do is to transform particularly the missing data items, but also um, some other things like, for example, if, if male is one and female is two, then we might as well just change them to being male and female so that when we do visualizations, the graphs will be labeled male and female instead of one and two, which isn't very um, meaningful. The other thing that complicates this data set is that um, the two, sort of categories of data that we want to know, one of which is sort of like basic information about the person, like their age and their weight and things like that is in one file. But the information that we actually want to look at, um, which is um, data collected on smoking, is in a completely different file. So in order to be able to do those, we're going to have to do a join. And each of the participants in the study were given a unique numeric code, and that's the field that we then can use to join the two um, data files. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing, so um, the uh, data that's available has stuff like height and also um, the weight, but one of the things that, um, there are some problems with, with just using weight because like, um, for instance, if you wanna know, one of the questions we can ask is like, 
is there a relationship between smoking and weight? Because people always say like, well, if you smoke, you tend to lose weight and stuff like that. But, you know, if you weigh 150 pounds, that might be obese for somebody who's like four feet, 10 tall, but it might be skinny for someone who's six feet tall. So it's really better to use something like body mass index. And so um, we actually will want to create some fields like that by calculating from other fields. So this is like why I like this sort of exercise, because these are a lot of the kinds of things that we learn how to do in the other um, sessions. And so we're going to actually apply those. So I divided this uh, assignments, if you want to call it that, into sort of three sections. So one is to extract the data. Um, and because of this issue that I had with it being hard for my computer to open a 1500 page PDF along with the data files, I just went ahead and described the data um, fields at the top of the script so that we don't have to try it because it was like really a pain to try to look them up in the um, in the experimental description. Um, so there's a certain columns that we want that we're going to extract. <clears throat> and then, like I said, this unique identifier, which they call AID, I don't, I don't know what the A stands for, but obviously ID is for the identifier. That's going to be our key. And then we'll save those in a file. And then basically clear out the memory and just reload from the file again. Um, the second step then is to do some transformation. So I mentioned already, <clears throat> if we want to see if your size is rela or what related to smoking, it would be good to calculate BMI. Um, also, we will have to go through and replace the missing values, particularly for something like, like um, weight. So like if your weight is um, you know, in pounds, and the missing value code is 999. If you don't change that in a missing value, you're going to be averaging in a bunch of 999 1,000 pound participants that really don't weigh 1,000 pounds. So that's pretty important. Uh, and then we're going to also calculate the age uh, and turn uh, the height and weight into uh, meters so that we can then do the um, body mass calculation. And we'll use piping because there's a bunch of different steps. And then the last thing, um, and this was an idea, the person who asked me to do this was interested in um, simplifying things by just coming up with a single factor that, that she called maternal closeness. Basically, mater if you're close to your mother, you get a value of one. And if you're not close to your mother, you get a value of zero for that. And so, um, there are actually like five different questions in each one of them, the, the top score like five means in some way you're close to your mother. Uh, and then the other four below that are you're less close to your mother. And so what she wanted to do was to anybody who gave the top score of five for all of the questions we would say is close to their mother and anybody who had anything else other than fives for any of them would be coded as a zero. And so that involves a rather complex calculation that I'm going to talk about in a, in a minute. And one of the reasons, like if all you were doing was just the um, checking on the numbers, it wouldn't be so bad. But you also have to preserve the um, missing data values in the process. And that makes it a little bit um, harder. So in order to do that, you, you have to use a function and it's one that we haven't actually talked about so far. It's called if else, and I'm going to um, talk about that for a minute. So if you're used to doing functions in Excel, this will be seem really familiar to you. Um, so essentially, what you do is you pass in some condition into the function, and then if that condition is true, it returns a certain value. But if that condition is false, it returns another value. So for example, um, if, if, call, if we're talking about um, this parental factor one, one of the parental closeness factors, if that's equal to one, then we want that to be coded as a one. If it's equal to a two, three, four, or five, then we want it to be coded as a zero. So I guess I said that backwards. Actually, being close to your mother, I think, is coded as one, and being not close is a five. 
So the, the syntax of it looks like this. So you say if else, and then you have your parentheses. And then the first thing, the first argument that goes in is a condition that you want to test. And in R, as well as some other languages, if you want to test for the condition of equality, you have to use two equal signs. And that's because, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, one equal sign is an option for the assignment operator, which we also typically use like the leftward pointing arrow, but in order, but you are allowed to use equal signs in R, so to prevent a collision between those two uses, you have to put two equal signs, which I always forget to do. And then in the next uh, argument, it's what the value should be if this condition is true. And then the final value is what you want the output to be if that value is false. Um, and we will need to do some more complicated conditions other than just um, equality. So we, to do those more complicated things, we can use some Boolean operators. So here are the three that we're gonna use. So an exclamation point is the operator for not, ampersand is for and, and a pipe character is for or. So just to show how we could use these. So if we want to say h1 pf5 is not equal to one, then we would say we would put the not operator in front. So it would essentially take the, ask is it equal, and then take that answer and say the opposite of it. If you want to add, if you want the condition to be that it does not have an NA value, there's actually a special function that called is.NA, and that returns true if it's an NA and false if it's not an NA. So if we want to know if it doesn't have an NA value, we have to put an exclamation point in front of it. And then here's how you could do, if you want to test whether two conditions are both true at the same time, you put the first condition, an ampersand, and the second condition. Similarly, if you want it to if you want it to produce true if either of the condition is true, then you put in a pipe character between the two conditions, which means that this can be true or this can be true. So we'll see examples of this um, in the in the code when we work on it. So that's a little bit of background, and um, I'll, I'll just pause for a minute and check whether anybody has any uh, questions. I forgot to turn on the chat. Let's see, where is that? Chat. Here we go. Aha. Uh -huh. I've been learning about the properties of pound NA in Excel for suppressing zeros and blank cells from being plotted in graphs. That is true. That uh, so pound N slash A is in Excel is very similar to the way that NA works. It's basically it throws a monkey wrench into the calculation and prevents it from being done. I don't know if there's a way to overwrite it in Excel, but um, we used to use that a lot for grades because if there was like a missing grade, the last thing you want to do is calculate the person's final grade when they have a test missing or something like that. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, well, let's just jump in then. So, um, if you, uh, let's see. So, the, um, the, if you want to try like live coding it with me, you can load this practice starter script. If you do that, I'm going to recommend that you also just have this, um, the R script from the last lesson we did because it has all the examples of how to do different kinds of things. And I'm a big believer in looking at code that I already have and then copying and pasting from it um, if I, uh, in order to save time. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click on raw here so that if there's a particular kind of thing we wanna do, we can find it in here and just copy and paste it. So I'm gonna leave that on the side. And then I have this tab open in case I want to cheat and actually just copy and paste the answers. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in. So let's see here. I don't want that. All right. So as I said, <clears throat> here is the listing of all of the um, the headers for the CSV file, or it's actually a 
TSV, which is tab separated values rather than commas. Um, and so these all just have different names, but these are consecutive columns. And so we can use that um, shortcut for referring to consecutive columns of putting the first column with a colon and then a second column uh, to define a range of columns. So that's useful to know. So these are all in the first data set, the one, data set number one. Um, so this has the bi various biological things and also the stuff about like, do you communicate with your mom very well? And then the second data set, data set 22, is the um, stuff about smoking and also height and weight. So um, if you are using Tidyverse, you can just load Tidyverse, but as I said, my computer um, doesn't, for whatever reason, Tidyverse doesn't work. So I'm gonna just load um, these two packages separately. Now, here's the tricky thing. In a lot of the previous examples, we just read data in from the internet. And if this weren't in ICPSR, I would just take the extracted data set and put it on GitHub. But part of the terms of use of the ICPSR data site is that you can't publish, you can't publicly expose the data. They want to make sure that people agree to their terms before they get access to it. So for that reason, we're going to have to actually load the data from our hard drive. So one of the things you need to know if, if you're on a PC, I would recommend putting it in like a, some folder under the C drive, just so that it's easier to write the path. If you're on a Mac, then you can put it in a folder underneath your home folder. So the abbreviation for home folder on a Mac is a tilde. So on my computer, I created, um, so here is my home folder, and I created a folder called um, NLS data. And then I actually downloaded the whole data set, so that's why I have all these folders here. But I just pulled out the pieces that I needed and put it in a folder called class. So that's why my path is home folder, NLS, class, and then a trailing slash. So um, if you need to figure out where you put the stuff, go ahead and do that and then um, just change this line basically to whatever is necessary for your computer. So I'm going to pause here and, and just um, make sure that everybody is good with that or if they have any questions about setting the path. What you can do basically is uh, set the path and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and run that. And then when you run the next line, um, okay, see how long it's taking to load the file because it's a 38 megabyte file. Anyway, go ahead and try to load the file. And if it shows up in your global environment, then you're good to go. If it gives you an error, then that probably means that you need to double check your path. So how are people, have people already done this or are they, how are we doing? Uh, okay, so with hex characters. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I know what I know what the problem is. The problem is that um, in in R, the uh, okay. So I think what you need to do is use forward slashes instead of backslashes. Try that because the black slash is the um, escape character. The other possibility, if using forward slashes doesn't work. Then, um, then what you may want to do is something like this, where you put um, a double backslash. And so the first backslash basically means the next character is not what you normally would think it is. But then if you put a second backslash, it's like, nope, I'm just kidding. It actually is a backslash. It like overrides the escaping. But I sort of think that since, well, I don't, I can't remember now whether PCs 
um, just understand the uh, Windows operating or the Windows file structure and allows you to go ahead and use the forward slashes or whether you have to escape them like this. Uh, did it work then? Okay. Oh, okay, still gonna try it. All right. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and um, and press forward because this is going to probably take us a while to do anyway, and so you won't get too far behind. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this line here, uh, and then open the second uh, file. And this one, okay, this one's much smaller, I think. Let's see, did we get it? That one's called physical. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it it has. Oh, it is. It is a bit slow because it has 920 rows and it has 920 columns and 5,000 rows. So it's it's pretty big. Um, in fact, it's so big I'm going to have trouble even looking at it in here. So I'm not going to try. This is why it took me forever to do this the first time. So um, okay. So what we want to do is. We want to get the columns that we want, and from uh, so we want these columns here pulled out of the data set and put into a new tibble that's not called closeness. So um, what I'm going to do is go and look here and remind myself um, how to do that. So. Um, Oh, I'm on the ggplot lesson. That's the wrong one. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't find what I was looking for. Okay, great. Uh, it's this one. Okay, cool. All right, so um, selecting columns. Here's what we want. Uh, and But we want to um, select the columns and then put them into uh, another, um, <clears throat> uh, put them into new columns. So we can use um, select and then just take the, the value of what we did on select and uh, assign it to another thing. So I'm just gonna go ahead to make my coding a little bit easier and copy that and paste it in here, oops, here. And um, so let's come up with a name for what we wanna call this. Um, let's see, I'm using closeness. Let's call it um, small. so we remember and then okay so when we're done we're going to take the answer and put it in there and then the name of the tibble that we're getting it from is this one closeness now we have to say what columns we want and so for these individual columns like this we can just um, list them and put columns in between them uh let's see wait i went too far here. Um, and uh, this. And this. Uh, okay, I keep going too far. Here it is. And uh, okay, still going too far. Where is it? Here it is. 
Now, as I said, I'm getting tired of doing this already. So we can save time here by um, doing a range of H1PF1 to H1PF5. So H1PF1 to H1PF5. And what do we have left? Uh, H1PF23 to 25. Okay, I think that's everything we want. So we're basically gonna pull all these columns out of the closeness um, tibble and then put them into another one called small closeness. So let's cross our fingers. Yay, okay, all right. So we still have a lot of observations, but we only have 12 rows instead of 6,250. And so if we look at what we have, we see that we just have the columns that we want here. Um, okay, this is like pretty painful. I'm thinking maybe just in the interest of saving time, it's time to cheat here. So um, I'm gonna just go ahead and bop over to this script here so that I don't have to type all of these. Okay, so that was faster. <laughs> okay, let's try running that. Okay, now we have a small version of this. It just has the columns that we want. And notice that both of them have this AID column, which has, this is what the identifiers look like. So that's how we're gonna join the two tables together. Um, okay, so now we need to, um, uh, so I think what I did myself was to save them in a file, but, um, in the interest of time, what I'm actually going to do here is just um, delete. Let's see, can I do that? No. No, I didn't want to do that. Rats. Okay, I don't know how to delete an individual um, data frame. And now I got a spinning circle again. Darn. Okay, well, the easy solution is to just um, save it in a file. Okay, great. Now I've got a spinning circle. Yeah, this is the problem with working with a giant data set. <laughs> All right, well, while its circle is spinning around, um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay, actually, I guess I did the join first. So let's go ahead and do that. So, um, to do a join, we want, so one of the questions here is, do we want to do an inner join, which is the kind that only copies the roles, the only copies the rows if the data exists in both tables? Or do we want to do an outer join where we preserve all the data, but we have missing data for any of the rows that don't match up? Any opinions on that? Well, since we're trying to do an analysis that goes across both of the tables, it's really not going to do us any good to have um, the rows that don't match up between the two tables in there. They're basically going to all have missing values for the other table that they're not in. So it's not, there's really not much of a point in doing an, uh, an outer join. So Let's go ahead and um, here is the, in the other lesson, how we do the inner join. So let's copy that and then, oops, hopefully the spinning circle is done spinning. 
Oh, great. Oh, here we go. All right, cool. OK, so all right, combine outer join. OK, so now we so what we want to do is put the names of the two tables that we want to join, which is small closeness and small physical. Then we have to say um, what the names of the uh, columns are that we're going to do the join with. And since it's the same, um, we don't. I have got a quick question. I know it yeah. looks like we do both the inner join and the outer join both, but I guess this one, it looks like you're assigning the inner join function to the outer join variable. Does that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, sorry. I'm glad you caught that. Yeah, so I think what I did, so, so my thinking was, I was thinking about in the future, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> that in the future, like maybe we'll need all the data and we should just save it. Um, so for this exercise, actually, we only need the, uh, we only need to do an inner join. Gotcha. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and only put that. Ah. Yeah, you're, you, that's a good catch. Thanks. Okay, cool. So Thanks. basically, um, I'm going to just delete this because in, in the interest of time, we're not going to ever do anything with the outer join data. So let's just forget about it. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay, so um, now what we need to do is to put in here um, what we want the uh, want it to join by, and since they are um, the same in both of the tables, we just need to put the the um, the name that the identifier is in. So the the column that has the identifier in it is called AID. So we just have to say, and for whatever reason, it has to be described as a vector with one item in it. So it's going to join by the AID column. And then I think the rest of this, um, I don't think that there are, are any um, differences. I don't think there's any overlap in the columns between the two tables. So I, I don't think we really need to worry about that. Let's try just leaving that out unless we get into trouble. Um, because I think that other than the identifier, we don't have the, the names that we chose for all of our columns are unique. So let's go ahead and see if that works. Okay, well, it didn't complain. So let's look at the data. All right, so it looks like it worked. Now, um, yeah, it worked. Cool. So I think we're ready to move on to the next task. And um, so, um, yeah, OK, so all good. I'm glad I did this, because I can never remember how to do this. So I just went ahead, and, and as long as you uh, called the file combined inner join, this code is already there for you. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. So what it'll do, it'll save it in the working directory in a file called inner raw CSV. Um, and notice here, I, I forgot to mention this, but the function that we used to read this in was read underscore TSV, not CSV, because like I said, for whatever reason, they, the, the um, fields are separated with tabs in this data file. And I, you know, I, I don't, typically people use commas. I don't know why they use tabs. So when I save this, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and save it as a CSV file. So that's why I'm using write underscore CSV. So let's go ahead and do that. And if I go here, uh, here's the file innerraw.csv, which maybe was already there. But anyway, we just created it now if it wasn't. So now what we can do. Um, 
the next stage, I, uh, I already have it just loading from the file. So now we can do what I wanted to do before, which is to go up here and basically delete all the data. And so what that's done, now I no longer have those two giant tables in here hogging my computer's memory. Um, and so hopefully we won't get bogged down uh, with, you know, like if it's doing intensive calculations or something. Okay, so any questions about what we did before uh, so far, or is that fairly straightforward for you? All right, I don't hear any questions. So now we're going to go ahead and basically um, this is if you came back another day, uh, like we don't actually have to redo these lines here because we already did them. But if you came back another day and you were starting from scratch and you just wanted to load your data from the file, you could run these three lines. And then, um, but uh, we don't need to do that. So I'm just going to do this one, which loads the data that we just saved into a um, uh, a tibble called inner raw and we can look and see what it looks like so it's basically the same data that we had just before we saved it uh, okay so we can um, let's go ahead and run this summary and see what happens so here is the problem <laughs> that i was telling you about if you if you have it take column h4 GH6 and H4 um, GH6 is the uh, weight in pounds. We see the problem that I was talking about. It's it's putting in missing values as 998 pounds. So we definitely are going to have to fix this. Otherwise, our, our um, analysis that we do is just going to be nuts. So. Um, uh, the um, the way that we can do this uh, is to um, use the mutate command. And so I already did this one for us here. So here's the tibble where we have our data in. And then what we want to do is to take what's in column H4 GH6. And then for every um, row, where it has a value greater than 990, we want it to put in a value of NA and then go ahead and, and replace the existing value with whatever we came up with. Then once we've done that, we want to put it into a tibble called um, no NAs. Um, and just, I think I have up here, yeah, so here, the, t the reason we use greater than 996 is there's actually two different um, missing data values, 996 and 998. And we'll catch both of them if we just use greater than 990. Uh, we'll lose any people that weigh 991 pounds, but I don't think there's any of them in the study. So, uh, okay, let's go ahead and run that. And now if we tell it to summarize it, it now says the maximum is 525 pounds and there are now 79 NAs. So it, that's great. It did what we wanted it to do and basically turned these um, coded um, things into, uh, into NAs. Okay, so I think now, um, let's see here. Uh, give me just a second to get organized here. So what we need to do now is um, we need to do this a whole bunch of times <laughs> because there's a bunch of things that have um, to, that have missing values. So let's try doing one, and then let's cheat and. Uh, and uh, just do the rest um, by um, uh, copying and pasting. Okay, so what we want to do, um, let's use 
piping. So what we're going to do is um, put the output into a new tibble that I'm calling BMI tibble, which basically means it's going to have all the columns in it that we need to calculate body mass index. And we're going to do that by starting with what's in this inner raw tibble here, this data right here. And then we're going to pipe it through a, a whole bunch of mutate functions like this. Um, and after we've mutated all the rows that need to be mutated, then we'll take the answer and put it into this BMI tibble. That's going to be our strategy. So um, the typical thing that you do when you're doing piping is to um, go ahead and indent on the next row and then each of the things, each of the pipes that you do um, gets put on a separate line just to make your code easier to read. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this function here because this is going to actually be the first one that we need to do. But one of the things to remember, if you recall um, when I was talking about um, piping, let's see if I can find that slide. Yeah, so when you're piping, you don't need to um, say the name of the tibble that you're piping it in from. So like in, if, if we just do an assignment operator, then we have to say, take the value in tibble x and put it in the function. But since we're just going from one function to another one to another function, we actually leave out the first argument, which is the name of the tibble that we want to perform the operation on because we're just performing the operation on the output of the previous line. So the way that's going to look here, it just basically means we don't need to say where the data is coming from. We're just saying the data is coming from whatever was on the previous line. So that should do what we want. And then once we get done doing that replacement, we just have to do a million more of them. So um, we'll do the first one uh, like manually here. So I'm just going to um, copy this and paste it in. Now we, so let's see, H4, GH6. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of them we have to do. So like the first one, let's go to, um, Eight, uh, H, H1, G, I, 1, Y. Let's see, H1. Uh, let's see. I have to say, okay, here it is, birth year. So birth year is coded with a missing value of 96. So I'm just going to go down here and... Do that, and I, in this case, I want to replace, I want to um, Okay, so before we do a, a million of these, let's just go ahead and see if the first two work or not. So um, if we Let's see, let's look at inner raw, H6GH6, where is it? H, uh, oh, maybe it's not in there, hmm, okay. Yeah, it should be. Okay, well, anyway, let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Okay. Um, so H1, G, uh, okay, here. So this is H1, G, I, 1, Y. If we look through here, hmm, wow, maybe there aren't any missing values. One problem is this is like a big data set. <laughs> okay, well, 
there's not very many missing values, but presumably any missing values in this column should have gotten taken care of. Um, I wonder if there is let's see what was it? H four G H six H four. Oh here it is H four G H six. Let's see if we can find any here. I know there's actually quite a few in here because like oh there is one. Okay. Line uh, I don't know what line number that is, but there's one of the um, 96s that got replaced with an NACE. All right, so that's good. We know that that worked. So, uh, okay, it's time to cheat because this is just going to take forever and we uh, are already almost out of time in our hour. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, go to here. Ooh, look at this mess. Okay. <laughs> Uh, copy and paste. So here you can see like why piping is actually a good thing. Uh oh, I must have missed one. Did I miss the last one? Um, Oh, I went ahead and piped it all. I went ahead and did the calculations for BMI. All right, okay, let's just cheat and do this too. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about what I did here. So first of all, the thing you can notice is like by doing this piping, it makes it a lot easier to see what's going on than if I have this extra stuff with like the input and the output tibble. It just makes it more complicated. And here I can just see, I'm going to mutate this, I'm going to mutate this, I'm going to mutate this, I'm going to mutate this. These are basically all the steps that I'm going to do. Then here I, I take the interview year and subtract the birth year. That's going to tell me how old they are. Here, converting from feet to inches, I take the height in feet, uh, sorry, the inches times, sorry, the height in feet times 12, and then add in the leftover inches. That's how I'm going to get um, the height in inches. Then I'll take the height in inches, multiply it by 2.54 centimeters per inch, divide by 100, that's going to give me the actual height in meters. And then here's the weight in pounds times the conversion factor of pounds to kilograms. That gives me the mass in kilograms. And then uh, I can calculate this new, uh, B so when I do mutate in this way, it's going to create a new column at the end of the table that wasn't there before. And so I'm going to end up with, if we look at the um, BMI table right now, you'll see that the last column is H4GHI, I think that is. But once I run this and it calculates th these additional things, there'll then be a height in meters, a mass in kilograms, and a BMI and an age column. So let's go ahead and just run this and convince ourselves that it works. Okay, didn't complain about anything. Now, I don't know if that's dynamically updated, so I'm just going to go ahead and click on this again. Okay, nice. So here, now we see the ages. Remember, this is, a, is like a teenagers. So we have ages ranging from 13 to 19. That's cool. Heights that are in the like one and a half to two meter range. That's also sensible. Uh, masses look good. And then here's BMIs. I don't really have a feel for what's a realistic BMI, but I'm pretty sure that that, that worked. Okay, uh, so it's two o'clock and basically we're out of time. <laughs> so um, if anybody wants to stick around, uh, we can, we could do more, but it, you know, I sort of promised 50 minutes. Um, but at least we did get to see uh, a couple of the um, 
things that, uh, you know, using piping, doing, creating new values, uh, doing a join between two tables. So those are some pretty typical things that you want to do with data wrangling. And um, just to, before we quit, I, I'm going to go ahead and go to the, um, the answers here. Oops, went the wrong way. So um, this is where things get really, really ugly. And um, so <laughs> in order to be able to do this maternal um, closeness thing, I had to first, this is how I went through and, um, and calculated for each of the five columns, whether it was zero or one based on like getting rid of all the, so everything, I think two through five got turned into zeros. So that does that for each of these five rows. And then I did this really horrible thing here where I said, um, if it is equal, if it's, if the first one's equal to one and the second one's equal to one and the third one's equal to one and the fourth one's equal to one, et cetera. Um, and then a, a second one for if, if, it's not, uh, if none of them have NAs in it, and if all of them have ones. <laughs> so this is like a really, really horrible, ugly statement here. And it took me like about 20 minutes just to figure out how to write it. But um, that's the magic that creates this maternal closeness thing. So anyway, what I encourage you to do, just go ahead and copy this um, code and try running it. And then um, <clears throat> down here, um, I did some plots. So remember earlier on, we talked about sort of like just doing generic plots. And then last time we talked about ggplot. So this is going to, the ggplot is basically going to make a, a be more beautiful and fancier plot than the generic one. So you can try running those and just see how it works. Um, so the questions that I was trying to answer here was to plot age uh, versus height, just because we know that age versus height, there should be a relationship there. And if that, you know, if this is like realistic data, we ought to be able to see something. And I'm also having them, the male heights be one color and the female heights be another height. Um, so this one here is just basically a test to see like, is, is this data really meaningful? Because we ought to be able to get something out of that. Then this is the question that the two questions that we really want to know is something about smoking. So this one is testing, is there a relationship between how close you are to your mother and whether you smoke or not? And again, we're not really talking about cause and effect here. You could smoke because you're not close to your mother, or maybe your smoking makes you not be close to your mother. We can't really tell the difference between those. But we're essentially trying to do um, a test to figure out um, a plot and a test to see if we can see any patterns related to that. And then similarly, we're going to do one um, uh, on whether there's a relationship between smoking and weight and between smoking and BMI. Um, so anyway, I would encourage you to just sort of run these one at a time and look at the look at the code and look at the results and try to sort of figure out how I did it. And of course, just doing the analysis is like not the, the hard part. The hard part is like understanding what does this actually mean or does it even mean anything at all? And I think you probably need to know more about um, uh, health and <laughs> analyzing long-term longitudinal studies than I do to know for sure. But I think in some cases you, we can see that it's pretty clear there's no pattern. So anyway, um, thanks for bearing with me. And does anybody um, have any questions they want to ask before we um, call it, uh, I, guess, I was going to say call it a day, call it a semester? <laughs> Hey, Steve. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you so much for the class you taught us. Thank you very much. It's oh, very you're helpful. welcome. Do, uh, should so I turn I, the recording off or is it okay to leave it run since you have a question?
Uh, so I have a very general question is that yeah. going forward, how can I improve myself in R? Because what we learned was a very good basic, mm -hmm. but going forward, I feel, you know, if I don't use it or if I uh, like don't practice it, I feel I'll forget it for sure. So mm -hmm. how can I uh, have that constant practice and how can I continuously learn and improve? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, what I have found for myself personally is it's good to have a project of some sort. So, I mean, even something like this, if it's not direct, that related to anything I'm actually doing in terms of research, but something that I want to try to figure out. And then that gives me the motivation to basically go to the available resources and try to figure out how to do it or to look at code examples that other people made and to try to like understand what they were doing so uh so that's a one possible thing to do the other thing is that we do have um the so that um r for data science book that i mentioned which is the the one that's available free online um that one it has a lot of ex it, it, it explains a concept and then has examples and the code is like there so the code and the data you can copy and paste so uh, it's actually a really great exercise to work through that book and you don't even have to work through the whole book you can actually look at the table of contents and figure out what types of things does he do in the book that you're interested in and then you can like go through those sections and that's like completely free and available to everyone the other thing is that I think I mentioned the library has paid for a rather expensive subscription to these O'Reilly um, resources. So there's a number of books there that, um, that you can look at and also a number of video series. And I know there are some on Learning R. I haven't actually vetted any of them, so I don't have one to recommend, but there's like a ton of them up there. So I would say, you know, depending on how you learn, if you want to be guided, like work your way through the R for Data Science book, if you want to learn on your own, come up with a project, if you like watching videos, then watch some videos. But I would say those three possibilities are, are all ways that you could learn more and also get in some practice. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah. I uh, like I was very like this class definitely helped me lay my foundation for the R. So I went to Coursera and then I decided to take a applied uh, data analytics in finance course because like I am of uh, finance, like I, I'm doing a major in finance. So I decided to use that. I decided to do that course. And I think that was really helpful for me because I can actually see how like I'm using R in finance. So I think that's, I, I felt it was a good way to specifically learn about my own specialization. How can I use R in that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And you know, this class has been very general because people are from all different fields. And um, you know, this was a social science example, but that you know R is used in finance it's used in like the natural sciences so i think if you can find examples or um you know courses that do the kind of analysis that you need to know for your research that's a really great idea um okay uh rachel has put a comment in here when you work on projects i'm finding it helps to leave a lot of comments through your code so two months from now you could remember what steps do what I totally agree with that. And as you can see, I, I do that in my code all the time. Um, and, you know, sometimes I put even more comments in than this. Um, and I also tend at the top of my code, like if I, if I go to a website or something that explains how to do something, I'll just put a comment and I'll put the URL up there. So if I don't remember how it worked, um, I would, I can go back and like relook at that, the explanation again. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's a really a great idea. It's, there's a, this whole thing called literate coding, which is essentially making your code understandable to your future self, as well as to anybody else who you might want to share the code with. That's, that's a great idea.
Anything else? All right, well, I appreciate you um, sticking with this and uh, I've seen a couple comments where people have said this is helpful. So I hope it is helpful. Um, you know, as I said, I'm like still an R learner myself, but um, I, I hope to continue learning. And um, I know in the case of Python, there's an interest in um, like having intermediate level um, follow-up things. And so it's likely in the future, either I or someone else might um, offer uh, like a follow-up uh, lessons. So if you have particular types of things that you would like to know how to do in R, please feel free to send those suggestions to me. And you know, if there's several people who are interested, um, we can maybe try to put either I can try to teach myself and put on some programming or we can uh, in our inter intermediate Python class we there's a person who is actually very knowledgeable who taught the class for us and that worked out really well so I'm, I'm very open to um, suggestions uh, let's see Unused argument. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the recording here, and if anybody needs to go, then um, 